Welcome to the Everything Epigenetics podcast, where we discuss DNA regulation and the insights it can tell you about your health. I'm Hannah Went, and I'm the founder of Everything Epigenetics. Today, my guest is Dr. Michael Skinner, and this is a podcast that is a must listen. Dr. Skinner is an expert in transgenerational epigenetic inheritance. And if you don't know what that is, don't worry, we are going to define that term for you and how important it is to our current health and the health of our future society. An introduction to Dr. Skinner. He is a professor in the School of Biological Sciences at Washington State University. He did his BS in chemistry at Reed College in Portland, Oregon, his PhD in biochemistry and chemistry at Washington State University, and his postdoctoral fellowship at the CH Best Institute at the University of Toronto in Canada. He has been on the faculty of Vanderbilt University and the University of California at San Francisco as well. He is the founding director of the Center for Reproductive Biology at Washington State University and University of Idaho, which is the largest reproduction biology center in the world with nearly 100 faculty. His current research has demonstrated the ability of different environmental exposures like toxins, for example, to promote this epigenetic transgenerational inheritance that I mentioned would be the main discussion for today. Dr. Skinner has over 350 peer-reviewed publications and has given over 350 invited symposia, lectures, and university seminars. He is the editor-in-chief of the Encyclopedia of Reproduction in the Oxford Publishing Journal, Environmental Epigenetics. He has done plenty of TED Talks and had documentaries done on his research with BBC Horizon, PBS Nova, Smithsonian, and France Art. Dr. Skinner has also founded several biotechnology companies. Like I mentioned in the beginning, this is one you will not want to miss. This idea that Dr. Skinner has been researching his entire life is so profound and really affects the, the rest of the world as we know it. So now for my guest, Dr. Michael Skinner. Welcome to the Everything Epigenetics podcast, Dr. Skinner. I'm excited to have you here today. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the invitation. Yeah, and you know, you have quite the resume. I remember originally hearing you speak at Preventative Lifestyle Medicine Institute in Seattle, Washington, last year at the conference run by Dr. Jeffrey Bland, and really knew I wanted to have you on the show. Um, you're an expert, I would say, in epigenetic transgenerational inheritance, which will be our main point of, of discussion today. And before we really dive into it, can you just talk about your story? Give our listeners a little bit more. You know, I gave them the, the common introduction and overview, but what made you interested in this field? And, you know, where, how did you end up landing where you are today? So uh, I've been at other universities, Vanderbilt University, I was on the faculty there, University of Southern California, San Francisco, and then I've been here over 25 years at, w at Washington State University. And um, I've always been interested in things that could not be explained through classic genetics. Uh, and you'd be surprised if you think about it. Most of the stuff we see in just phenotypic variation, disease, and so forth, uh, it's very, very difficult to explain them with classic genetics because classic genetics is exceedingly low frequency uh, for any kinds of genetic mutations. So uh, that really spawned my interest in epigenetics, and we've been studying it for 30 years, basically. Yeah, definitely. It's always interesting to note, of course, genetics definitely doesn't give you the, the best picture, which is the main point of my podcast is, you know, looking into more of these epigenetic factors. So I want to break it down and start with the basics. I think a lot of my listeners are familiar with the epigenetic modification of DNA methylation. But again, I want to start with these primary factors. So sure. There's, you know, several other epigenetic mechanisms and, and marks that I think are, are obviously worth discussing. Would you be able to describe those those other factors? I know when you, you gave your presentation, you have this really nice 
you know, photo with the histo modifications, chromatin structure, non-coding RNA, and of course the DNA methylation. But do you want to walk us through some of that? Sure. Um, let me give you a little history. Yeah. With your audience. And so it was the 1950s. Mm -hmm. There was a fellow named Carter and Waddington. And he was also doing things that were not following classic genetics too. So he took fruit flies, exposed them to heat, and it changed the wing structure. And it was passed for 16 generations. And so clearly it couldn't be a, a genetic process that sort of drove that. So that was when he coined the term epigenetics and studied it uh, on a more sort of phenotypic sort of level for another, the next 20 years. It wasn't until the 70s that the first epigenetic biomarker sort of came available, and that was DNA methylation. And it really wasn't until the 70s and 80s, 80s was really when it started going sort of as heavily. And then we found other types of epigenetic marks. So epigenetics is defined as molecular factors and processes around the DNA that regulate genome activity, what, what genes are on and off, completely independent of DNA sequence. So this is a non-genetic cross process. And then the last part of that definition is that this is also mitotically stable. So when a cell divides into two daughter cells, not only is the DNA replicated, so the both daughter cells have the same DNA, the epigenetics that's in the cell, all of those epigenetic marks on the DNA also are exactly replicated, okay? And so it's molecular factors and processes around the DNA, or around the DNA, regulate genome activity, independent of DNA sequence, and it's mitotically stable. So it's a very defined sort of thing. And over the years, over the past 30 years, 40 years, they've realized that there's right now five, potentially one new, new one, uh, six, but there's five well-known sort of epigenetic components, as you mentioned. It's DNA methylation, histone modifications, chromatin structure, non-coding RNAs, which is a major one. And the new one is sort of a, a there's also RNA methylation and there's a new methylation called adenine methylation that's relatively new. Perfect. Yeah, I, I missed that RNA methylation. And what'd you say the new one was? Uh, there's a DNA, there's adenine. Adenine, okay. Base pair in the DNA. It's not real frequent. It's very much more developmentally and it's an, and not a, quite as frequent as DNA met, uh, cytosine methylation. Uh, but that one is, is sort of one of the newer ones, basically. In the last gotcha. a few years, basically. Perfect. Thank you for that. And you mentioned when you went over the non-coding RNA point, you said this one's really important. What made you say that? So, um, <laughs> uh, and this was another big surprise. I mean, the Nobel Prize was given in, in 2000 because of this. Um, we have 20,000, well, maybe 25,000 genes. Okay. And uh, everybody gets all excited about the fact, oh, we have 25,000 genes. We could do lots of things with that and so forth. There's 250,000 non-coding RNAs. They're all different. And so just in sheer mass, there's a lot more going on with the non-coding RNAs uh, than, we, than we sort of realize. And so essentially, they are a very important epigenetic component. And these things that we just talked about, all of these epigenetic marks, are highly conserved evolutionarily. So they are in a microbe up to a human. And they were here in the beginning, just like DNA. DNA wasn't like there before and then it was evolved. They co-evolved at the same time. And this is what is what was dis, uh, evolved to regulate DNA function. DNA can't regulate its own function without having epigenetics involved. Yeah, thank you for, for that that explanation, something I, I also didn't know. So I'm sure we'll, we'll see a lot more research in the future, hopefully with that non-coding RNA and, and, you know, that epigenetic modification and then the, the adenine methylation too. Now, like I mentioned, your main point of focus and something I'm super interested in for many reasons is that epigenetic transgenerational inheritance. It's a little bit of a mouthful, but what is this? Why is it important? Why do we care? Um, and, 
yeah, what makes that a big part of your your research and focus? So um, if you ask anybody off the street and say, what <laughs> what's inheritance? They will tell you, you inherit your DNA from your parents and that's genetic inheritance. Mm-hmm. And that concept's been around since the late 1800s, early 1900s, basically. And, and basically Mendelian phenomena was based on this inheritance sort of concept. We didn't really appreciate the fact that there was this thing called DNA at the time, but basically even then that this genetic sort of inheritance sort of came up. So, uh, so that's been around forever and everybody's taught that in school and so forth. So it's not like I went looking for this uh, <laughs> separately. I, I'll tell you this story. Uh, <laughs> we were doing a study in a, in a rat model, okay? And we, were, we wanted to study sex determination, the testis and ovary development in the early fetal development period. So there was a pregnant mat, rat, and we exposed it to what's called it. A chemical that's an endocrine disruptor it blocks androgen actions the male hormone and so i wanted to see if we could interfere with sex determination in the testis and the ovary Maybe mostly the testis by putting in this thing right during chemical uh, during uh, the div- uh, gonadal sex determination mm-hmm. did a short term exposure let all the animals to be born and lo and behold the, the result was there was uh, no effect <laughs> no effect on sex termination, nothing. So it was a really good example of a failed experiment. So we couldn't really manipulate sex termination. So um, what we did do is we aged those animals up to be about a year of age. And then we looked at the testes and found that the spermatogenic cells, this developing, the cells that will develop into sperm, were dying at high rates. Uh, they basically were undergoing a process called programmed cell death or apoptosis. And then so there was significantly higher in the exposed animal than the non-exposed animal, which was interesting. So we actually put all that together and published a paper and that was it. A few months later, my postdoc came in and she was very upset. And she said, oh, I accidentally bred these animals to the next generation. (laughs) And they were aging and so forth. And she was all upset. I said, don't worry about it. Go look at this next generation and you know do the analysis and see what you find. So she came back and said, uh, it's the same thing. The next generation has the same effect. Even though the exposure was back here, two generations later, we saw the effect. Mm. So of course, I didn't believe her. When I <laughs> did this 30 different times and we took it out to the third generation and essentially found that we had a very reproducible effect going out three generations where here's a chemical that came in. This chemical cannot change DNA sequence. It's not a muted mutagen, just an endocrine abnormality was, was put in place and it went out three generations. So we repeated this and we basically, I was very conservative. So we actually sat on the data for a good four or five years and did the experiment multiple different ways and different chemicals and things. And basically then published in 2005, the first paper where we coined the term epigenetic transgenerational inheritance. And the reason I was a little bit concerned was what I'm proposing or what I proposed at the time was a non-genetic form of inheritance. Mm -hmm. Something that nobody even considered because we were so ingrained in genetics, we still are, that genetic inheritance was the only thing being inherited. Well, what we just showed was epigenetics can actually get inherited. And there's this whole phenomenon is mediated by alterations in the DNA methylation and, and pass forward and so forth through the germline, through the sperm. So the only thing that you're going to ever inherit is comes from your either sperm or egg of your parents. It has to be through mediated through the germline. There's nothing else that can actually do this. It has to go through the main uh, germline. And so that was the ex- explanation. So it was going through a germline sort of process. And then basically the new next generation would be reprogrammed accordingly, like a parent was. And then essentially you'd carry this for multiple generations. So since that initial observation, and just to clarify within that paper got a lot of uh, press and within a year, there was another article that this was in science and there was another article in science a couple of years later where I was, I was labeled an epigenetic heretic. 
<laughs> epigenetic heretic. Because I was proposing this, this weird thing of, of, of uh, epigenetic inheritance that nobody had even sort of thought about or, or before. Since then, Thousands of papers have been published, documented in, in just about every single species that you can examine, from um, uh, plants to humans. Everything that they've ever examined has this epigenetic inheritance, and it, and this is really designed to allow the environment. And, and most of the studies done uh, after ours were, were done with nutrition, both high fat diet and caloric restriction. We've done it with 30 or 40 different environmental chemicals. And then there's lots of people that have done everything from temperature to toxins like alcohol. I mean, pretty much anything you can think about in the environment mm -hmm. tested to promote this sort of phenomenon. There's critical times of development where it's more sensitive than others. And, uh, but this evolutionarily is how the environment has an impact on the individual's development to give it its phenotypes later on. Now, if you do a genetic type of experiment for this, let's say you were looking at a, a given phenotype as a, a later in life, and this animal has a different phenotype than this animal, but it's the same species. Mm -hmm. Now we know if you try to do genetics to actually find that through genome-wide association studies where you look for mutations, they're generally not there. There's none. Now, some diseases they've done, well, actually most of the diseases they've looked at, always have a positive GWAS uh, mutation. The issue is that it's really only in one out of a hundred people with the, with the disease. So it's a 1% frequency at best, usually it's less. So genetic mutations are such a low frequency that it's, it's hard to explain how they could have an impact on biology and, so, and the major way we think about it in terms of genetic determinism. Epigenetics, however, when we look at those those phenomena, generally it's greater than 90% of the individuals who have the epigenetic mutations, have the epigenetic chains that give you that phenotypic variation. So it's an environmental thing going through the epigenetics to, then the epigenetics can regulate the genome, act, what genes are on and off and so forth. So there, it's not that the DNA is not important, it's just basically, it's not necessarily, it's certainly not responding to the environment, it's the epigenetics is. Uh, and then you get the phenotypic short shift or the disease development. And so, right. so this, this is really this epigenetic transgenerational inheritance is a whole new way of thinking about, you know, what your great grandfather or grandmother was exposed to uh, is going to affect your disease and your phenotypes because of that epigenetic shift that you're inheriting. And you're going to pass it on to your grandkids as well. So this changes how we, think about the environment and also what we're doing our, to ourselves in terms of our exposures as humans. Yeah, definitely. I remember hearing you speak again at, at that conference, not knowing anything about this epigenetic transgenerational inheritance. And when you spoke, I was scared, <laughs> like, you know, viscerally, I was kind of analyzing everything I did within the past week, you know, month, years to, to my body. And, you know, especially for people who want to have children, passing those signatures on to your children as well. So it really made me very analyze, um, kind of what I was doing from, from a health standpoint and everything, you know, the toxic environmental factors that were, were surrounded with, um, daily. So yeah, that I, I love how you told a story there. So you, you really couldn't believe it when you're, you said your grad student, I believe, or, or student came to you and said, you know, I, I'm seeing this, you know, and you, you just couldn't believe it. And that, that's so profound, holding off the data, doing multiple studies, making sure that you're seeing this change through these generations. Um, of course, it not being a genetic factor, but some type of external stimuli, you could say. Yeah. And um, just to kind of wrap that back up as, as well. So that was the very first example you saw of epigenetic transgenerational inheritance. That was when you had the rats and you gave them that anti-androgenic endocrine disruptor, correct? Correct. correct. And, and we've done it with everything we can think of. Uh, <laughs> more recently, we did glyphosate, which is the most heavily used herbicide used worldwide now. It's pretty much in most of our foods products. And it can promote a very nice transgenerational effect. Um, 
Glyphosate's interesting in the sense that it has no effect with direct exposure. F F0 or F1 generation don't have any effect. It's not until you get to the grandchildren, the F2 or the F3 generation, the great-grandchildren, that you actually see a very significant increase in disease. So it's a very, so we call that concept generational toxicology. There is no essence, essence toxicology with direct exposure, but it appears two or three generations later. We didn't know the compounds could do that. And so mm -hmm. this really does make us sit back and think about it. First of all, no government, including ours, checks for transgeneration toxicology. All they look for is direct exposure toxicology. Companies don't test with that type of thing. They just look at direct exposure. So they essentially design relatively safe compounds like glyphosate for direct exposure. But if you don't look several generations later, you don't realize that it's just as harmful. It's just right. And yeah, and, and what's the... How many generations have you you studied in, in a single, um, I guess, you know, cohort or, or kind of research experiment? How far have you gone? We're doing a long-term study now. We've taken about 10 generations and we see some very similar phenomena. If anything, the farther out you go, the you get more and more disease. And we're now pushing 20 and it's it's get, it's very scary in terms of uh, some of the, some of the effects we're seeing. There's some major disease effects of, and this is 10 or 10 generation move. Now, just to clarify, probably the first time, well, the first time this was ever done was there's a fellow, his name was Linnaeus. And Linnaeus, uh, so did it, he was a plant, and he actually came up with the concept of, tox, uh, of taxonomy, where he actually put, took all the plants and organized them into families and so forth. That was the first time that had ever been done. Well, he did a heat exposure of a plant and it changed the flowering phenotype of the plant. And then he took it another generation and saw the same flowering phenotype. So this is kind of cool. So that was mm -hmm. just a sign. Nobody really paid attention to it. So there was a scientist in um, around 2000 that actually was also a plant scientist. He, he knew about this flowering phenotype. So he, and this plant that Linnaeus generated was actually propagated for a hundred generations. So that's what the guy did in 2000. And essentially, he then looked at the plants, found an epigenetic change, and went back to the original plant. So that was 100 generations. Now, there's organisms like C. elegans or Drosophila. Drosophila is a fruit fly. The, uh, and essentially, C. elegans is a little tiny worm. And those have such rapid generational times. Those have also been exposed to an environment, so they have a shift in the phenotype. And it's taken out a hundred generations and you still see the phenotype a hundred generations later. And so even then, so mammals, we've not taken it out as far because it's hard to do that much. Uh, right. But we definitely can take it out probably. And there's a number of publications that have taken it out for five generations. Uh, and same thing. I think it's going to be as permanent as we've seen in other organisms like plants and, and so forth going forward. Sure. It's not necessarily a, short-term phenomena. Yeah, definitely. And is that uh, F10 generation you mentioned, is that study currently ongoing with rats? Is that yeah, what it is? Just, we're just in the, it's in rat study and we're finishing up the molecular work. And so that's not been published yet. Perfect. Perfect. And what are some, while we're on this, this subject of, you know, being exposed to these different toxins, can you name some of the other toxins that you've looked at? You know, again, what kind of effect can this this really have on our health? You know, we're talking real life impact here. I, I kind of would almost think the opposite that the the health effect would lessen over time, right? Like, if if you're passing it on, I, I definitely didn't think uh, that would have a, a larger effect, which again is is um, yeah, very scary. <laughs> so it be it, it's because the epigenetic inheritance, the epigenetic shift in the germline, it doesn't go away. In other words, that's that's the new program. That's the new baseline. And so essentially that's what gets passed going forward. Now, if another compound comes along, then you can actually amplify that and so forth. And so, but yeah, we, we, we thought that potentially as you got out farther. Now, the people that are doing the worm studies or the fly studies, they didn't see, they saw the same thing. The phenotype either stayed the same or got worse as you went out. It didn't definitely didn't go, go away. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
And so we've studied compounds. I mean, we, we started out with endocrine disruptors like benclozolin. We've also done DDT, which is an estrogenic sort of compound. We heavily used pesticides in the 1950s. Um, we've done we've done literally about 30 of them. We've done anti uh, plastics, uh, heavy metals. Uh, uh, like the bisphenol A actually promotes a very strong uh, transgenerational impact and epigenetic effects. Uh, and so, literally, yeah, everything from heavy metals to uh, to estrogenic, any end, uh, endocrine sort of disruptors, and then there's things like dioxin. It's not really a uh, endocrine compound, but it's just a toxic compound. It'll do the same thing. So we've not really found any chemical we've tested that doesn't promote the phenomena. So all of all basically environmental toxic. Now, now I don't want to leave leave you thinking this is just a toxic sort of thing. Like I said, caloric restriction or diet are just as impactful promoting a transgenerational effect. Uh, smoking and alcohol will do the same thing. And one of the, the, about two years after we published our study in about in 2005, there was a, a woman in uh, Europe in the University of Zurich, Isabel Mansui, that did a stress. She did a, a basically a stress study uh, in an animal mouse model and essentially found that there was an epigenetic effect due to the stress that became going, it got transgenerationally transmitted as well. And since then, there's been lots of been the post-traumatic stress syndrome is now thought to definitely be an environmentally induced uh, epigenetic sort of thing. And so stress, uh, just environmental stress, uh, can actually do the same sort of thing. And so Pretty much, and then, and if you look at plants and so forth, and, and even some animals, you know, uh, sunlight or high temperatures, and all of those environmental sort of things associated with climate change can do the same thing as well. So our biology is being shifted by our environment through this environmental genetics. Yeah, and what a, I, I want to hang on to a point that you said there. You said caloric restriction and diet change. Now, because of, of my work and position with True Diagnostic, you know, we talk a lot about lifestyle recommendations and, and different things. Are you saying caloric restriction actually has a negative effect with that translational epigenetic inheritance? Sure. Um, this is a, something the general public doesn't know well, uh, very well as well. Mm -hmm. um, the original observations on this were made in the 60s. Okay. What they did is they took a couple animal models. I think fox was one and a wolf was another one. And they basically monitored these animals during uh, really, really bad weather where there was essentially caloric restriction of the population. Okay. And essentially what, what happened is the epigenetics would change the metabolism of the developing fetus uh, such that when it was born, it could survive on less calories. And this is called the thrifty phenotype. And that's what they call the thrifty phenotype. And it was done in several different species. And, and then, so then if there's several years of this bad weather type sort of situation or basically caloric restriction, those young offspring now can survive better than their parents could, okay? So if you caloric restrict an individual, to, to basically have weight loss and stuff like that. And you did this during pregnancy, your, your offspring would have that programming, okay? And maybe, and if you look at the human population in the 1700s, 1800s, so we didn't live on high calorie diets anywhere near like we're doing today. And so essentially humans were designed with this caloric, this thrifty phenotype. Unfortunately, if you take those same animals, okay, and then put them on a high fat diet, what do they do? They develop obesity, much higher susceptibility to get obesity than the regular individual doesn't have the thrifty phenotype. And so this is a really well established phenomenon. And now in more recent times, we've realized that this is an epigenetic programming that's modifying your metabolism and it gets programmed and it's mediated through the germline so you can inherit it. And so uh, through epigenetic inheritance. And so it's, it's, there's a reason to a degree. So we did a DDT exposure, okay? We took the animals out three generations. The number one phenotype we saw was over 50% of the males and 50% of the females in the third generation had obesity, metabolic disease and obesity. 
from a three generation previously DDT exposure. So the human population, first of all, DDT was the first agricultural compound made, synthesized in the late forties and they're well and won the Nobel Prize for that. In the 1950s then they used DDT uh, for trying to get rid of malaria in both Europe and North America. Unfortunately, in the 1950s, for the whole decade, there was no concept of toxicology. There was no concept of epidemiology. These, these things didn't exist. And so they just figured, well, the more we use, the better. And so they literally used thousands of times higher than what they should have used to basically try to get, and they did get rid of them. The malaria disappeared and it worked. But the entire population in the 1950s uh, there is not an individual that wasn't exposed, and all children born were exposed. So we're three generations from the 1950s, and our obesity epidemic in the United States is 50% of our population has obesity. It's not, not that diet and how much food you eat is not a factor. It is a very important factor. But what we're saying is the epigenetics drives your susceptibility to get obesity. And if you, because of those exposures today, we are have an increased susceptibility to get obesity. And what we found in our study was there were their litter mates, their litter mates that are on the same exact diet, same exact exercise, and half of them would get obesity and half of them wouldn't. So this is a programming of your metabolism that basically is involved on the same diet sort of situation. Now, there are individuals certainly that eat excessively and that'll certainly promote their obesity and so forth. But I think the general population, we don't realize that there is this molecular basis for the susceptibility to get obesity. And so- Yeah, yeah. that's amazing. <laughs> It, it, again, so profound because you, you always hear about, yeah, this obesity ec ep epidemic, right? And that could have been because of that DDT exposure that happened in, in the 1950s. So it's, you know, coming back full circle and, and making some more, more logical sense. But then also, like you said, you know, it, it does play a part of, you know, what, what's our diet, our fitness regimen, et cetera, that definitely adds a, a layer or a component uh, in there as well. Um, so Dr. Skinner, what about you? What what from your research has changed, you know, your lifestyle or has it had an effect on it at all? You know, what were what were would be some recommendations that, you know, you would give unsolicited to, to people or d does that make you think about your own health differently? Um, well, certainly people need to be worried about their health. Their diet is a big one. Their exercise is a big one. Um, exercise is very critical for for, you know, so those are lifestyle sort of considerations that will definitely impact our health. And we have lots and lots of data to actually support that sort of thing. But for our purposes, I'm a scientist. And so what we've been doing is taking a different tact. And so if this is real, then essentially generationally, I and mean, even an individual individual that has a certain lifestyle early in life versus later, we should be able to identify epigenetic marks in the individual that would one, potentially identify what diseases they may be susceptible to, and two, whether there was this early life exposure that they're inheriting from their parents or grandparents, that kind of thing. And so in other words, they're, called, they're epigenetic biomarkers for disease, for exposure, and basically, and, and so forth. So the first one we did, uh, we took a sperm from men that were either infertile or fertile. Infertile sperm, men are infertile. they still have sperm, sometimes the same count, but their motility and structure and things like that of the sperm can be abnormal. Okay, so we took sperm from infertile men versus fertile men. And we found a very distinct biomarker for fertility, infertility, okay? Which is nice to have. In other words, if you go to an IVF clinic, lots of the men's sperm numbers would be fine, and so they would use it in IVF. This could actually tell them, oh, your sperm is going to be infertile because of these epigenetic things, so then you can make sort of decisions and so forth. Also, one of the one of the pharmaceuticals used to treat and get higher fertility, we actually found a biomarker for that as well. Okay. So essentially that was our first foray into it. But since then, 
we've found epigenetic biomarkers for preterm birth, female arthritis, or rheumatoid arthritis, a whole series of different diseases where some of these, if you, if you have these epigenetic biomarkers, this could have a very big impact early in life. So for example, for the rheumatoid arthritis, by in, if you took an analysis to whether you were going to be susceptible to get arthritis, okay, and you did this in your 20s or 30s, and you had a positive sort of test, it turns out in your 30s and 40s, some of the pharmaceuticals they use to treat arthritis can also be used to be treated in the 30s and when you're in your 30s and 40s before you have arthritis. And if you do that, it'll delay the onset or prevent it from developing later on. That's called a preventative therapeutic, okay? Today, we have a bunch of preventative therapeutics that we could potentially use, but we do not know who to give them to, and it's inappropriate just to give them to everybody. And so this will help usher in the era of preventative medicine rather than the reactionary medicine we do now after the disease develops. And this will all be based on potentially epigenetic biomarkers. And so we were... Today, we spend most of our time, we still do some basic research along the epigenetic inheritance activity, but we spend well over half our work taking a specific disease and identifying its, its uh, ability. So recently, we also did another one that got everybody excited was we took sperm from men that had autistic children versus men that didn't have autistic children, okay? And we basically found that, and in autism, it's a three to one ratio for men to a mothers. In other words, a patern it's a paternally transmitted disease predominantly. Mothers will transmit it about, you know, a third of the time or about a quarter of the time, but it's a three to one ratio essentially. So it's primarily a paternally transmitted disease. It's, that's been known for a while. So when I, knew, when I saw that, I said, this has to be an epigenetic phenomenon. So we basically found this night biomarker for this paternal transmission of autism. Now, you could then decide, well, if you know you're going to pass, pass the autism, you could potentially get a donor, donor sperm or something that doesn't have this and use that instead. Or by simply knowing that you have it, when your child is born, and there are clinical management practices in the first year of life that will reduce the severity of the autism from a really high severity five or six down to a one or two or three that is relatively low and manageable. And so that again is a preventative you know, therapeutic strategy. So I think in the future, epigenetics will usher this in. And so we may not be able to fix the problem of this generational sort of toxicology but we may be able to treat it much more effectively through preventative medicine sort of approaches. So for me, that's sort of our main push right now is to actually come up with these sort of epigenetic biomarkers that we can use for that purpose, which are uh, oftentimes potentially inherited from your parents or grandparents through epigenetic inheritance. So all about identifying you know, I guess what, whatever outcome you're looking for, right? That area of interest and then being able to mitigate that effect or, you know, prolonging the disease uh, progression or, or even diagnoses. So um, yeah, I'll definitely have to have to have you back on when you have more, more research behind that, right? Everyone wants to know what they can be doing. Um, but for you all listening, this is, this is really the future. I'm, I'm learning, you know, so much more, um, even from when I just, just heard you speak, you know, a couple months ago. So it's, it's, super interesting. And, and I know, uh, you know, there, there are a ton of fertility based companies right now, right? Trying to work on on this, you know, infertile issue. So a lot of that, I think, does point back to your work and this epigenetic mechanism that we can we can look at. And then, like you mentioned, make decisions on, on kind of how that that pathway will move forward. Um, I know you mentioned it earlier, Dr. Skinner, I want to come back to this you know, from a policy standpoint, you mentioned the government just looks at, you know, the generational effect. Is there anything we can do? Is there anything, you know, in the future, near near future that you see happening with, with the government for studying more of this transgenerational epigenetic inheritance? So um, it's a difficult question. 
Some, our government is very, very much um, conflicted with industry and government uh, in designing rules for toxicology and chemical use and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, the current sort of strategy is that they tend to lean towards not doing something than doing something even if there's some data going going forward. So there's a great deal of problems going on. It's partly due to the structure of our government, the way we have it set up. Unfortunately, the Environmental Protection Agency, which is the one that's supposed to sort of do a lot of this, is uh, not set up so it has an independent budget. Like many uh, government agencies, like the National Institute of Health, has an independent budget built into the uh, going into the government sort of budget. The EPA has uh, basically a budget that's determined by Congress, and so therefore, if there's industry lobby on the Congress, you're going to have problems with the EPA budget. So they have very significant limitations in our setup in the current U.S. system has problem. Because of that, um, this is a very sensitive topic when you talk about chemicals and things like that. And so there's not a whole lot of progress expected from the government. And I think in the US, um, it would take a significant public sort of push to actually have anything happen. Now, it's different in, the, in the Europe. Mm -hmm. Europe actually has committees and so forth that are put in place to actually independent, they're not, you know, independent of industry and that sort of stuff, and they make decisions and so forth. And so they have banned many of the compounds we have tested going forward. And they sometimes do it really, really quickly. The, one of the first times I gave a public talk in Europe on being, our work on Clozolin, which is the antiandrogen, which is a fungicide used in agriculture, we were in uh, uh, Switzerland. Uh, and they're very progressive. And so essentially I gave the talk and there was lots of these discussions around the politics and so forth. And literally within a month, there was a proposal to ban the clothesline, which like, and, and so I said, well, you got you can't be too reactionary. You actually have to get some supportive science and that sort of stuff. But so that's just like the opposite. So they are the first sort of entity that's looking at banning glyphosate. It's pretty close, but it's still not there for the same sort of purposes. Uh, the problem with glyphosate is so heavily used in agriculture today, it's hard to actually pull back from it. Um, and so in terms of solving this on a government level and so forth, it's going to take a significant amount of time, probably a few generations, and, and sort of a heart, you know, a public sort of uproar about going forward and, and but people are starting to pay attention even the farmers i live in an agricultural area and the farmers have been using glyphosate on their crops for a long time and a lot of the men that now get older have diseases that are now linked to the these agriculture chemicals and so, forth. so they're sort of aware of it. so i think with time things will change but my suspicion is trying to fix it at that level is going to be very inefficient and fixing it at a level of preventative medicine, the induction of preventive medicine, using these tests and so forth, saying, well, we know you were exposed, your grandparents were exposed, you inherited, therefore you're going to get this, so we can give you this at an early time. So uh, an example is that breast cancer. One of the first preventative treatments identified was for breast cancer. There was a chemotherapy called tamoxifen. Uh, which is not really efficient uh, in terms of stopping the chemo. It's not a good chemo, but it's a it's a reasonable compound. But they realized that if they gave ke the chemotherapy in your 30s or 40s, that you could delay the onset of the of the thing and maybe get get rid of it, and so it would develop later in life. And so that NIH actually ran a, a trial for a long period of time to actually do that as a long studies. But so so I think. That's where we should focus our efforts and activities to actually push towards preventative medicine using the epigenetics as a diagnostic because the government change in terms of chemical use and so forth. Is, and it's not just chemicals, our daily sort of activity. You have to realize if it's stress, we get stressed all the time, but just through our daily lives. I mean, this is, this is across the board. It's not just the chemical industry. This is really our lifestyles today. And so 
So yes, changing our lifestyles to try to minimize that is certainly one big step. Hopefully the governments would step up at some point, but really taking a slightly different view to medicine and moving it towards preventative medicine is probably going to be the biggest impact, I think. Sure. And the stress is not good to hear. I'm a naturally stressed out person. I, I think I say that on like every podcast is like, I'm just one of those, you know, people who's always like hyper alert, hyper aware. And I'm very aware that it's not good for my health. So I, I, I see your, your pattern of thinking though, take that preventative approach. Hopefully the government catches on, can't be too reactive though, to, you know, findings. We, we need to, you know, look at all of the data. So philosophically, and this is very, you know, philosophically speaking, if you believe there was some massive change, like in the next couple of generations to come where it's, you know, you're super healthy and you're doing all of the things right and everyone becomes super proactive. Do you think we could eventually, you know, flip those epigenetic modifications or switches and, you know, reverse almost all of that damage that has become from, like you said, the DDT exposure and all of these kind of um, toxics that we're being exposed to? Uh, so I hate to be the bad news person, but no. No? Okay. No, I, I want to hear it. You're you're the expert here. Um, There's a, a programming. If you can take this out a hundred generations, has been has been done in a number of species like plants. Um, and Essentially, it gets programmed. It, or we have a new physiological molecular sort of trait, and that's this is our, our environment's driving it. And once it's put in place, evolutionarily, we have a certain phenotype associated with it. And so, uh, this is this really it's not like you could do something to turn it around now during the process timing of the exposure. Uh, this has been shown that if you actually took s certain uh, diets and so forth during the exposure, you can reduce the impact of the exposure later on on epigenetics and so forth going forward. And so those types of things could be done. But once it's programmed, like if your great grandparents were exposed to something and it got programmed in their germline and you inherited it, there's not a lot you could do about that. Yeah, it's still still there. And so now, so however. Knowing that it's going to be there, knowing you're going to, you're susceptible for obesity, knowing you're, you know, you have neurodegenerative issues and so forth, you can take lifestyle changes to actually reduce those phenotypes and delay the onset and so forth, like the preventative medicine sort of approach. So I think there are things you can do. It's just that you're not going to necessarily fix it. Fix it, yeah. And it's because this is not just in terms of what's going on in, in our lives on a daily level or even during your life. This is, it, it, this epigenetics affects everything you can think about from disease etiology or phenotypes, your longevity, all that sort of stuff, but it also affects things like evolution. In other words, we've had this genetic sort of concept for evolution, which is not inaccurate, but it's just not the whole story, but essentially when a phenotypic variation occurs within a population, Okay. There's a reason for it and it's environmental epigenetics. Okay. So then if there's a subpopulation that has an adaptive phenotype and, an, and natural selection goes through to actually promote the evolutionary event, this is being controlled through environmental epigenetics to give you that adaptive phenotype. So you can't change those things quickly. It, it takes, you know, now you can, you can slowly, over time, you know, have new sort of environmental sort of things actually driving new epigenetics and so forth to get things to change. And that's how evolution sort of works along with the genetic sort of change. So unfortunately, no, this is a uh, sort of a programmed event. It's, it's, it's almost as stable, if not the same as the stability of the DNA sequence, essentially, which you can't really change your, you, know, your gene, you can't change your DNA sequence. And unfortunately, some of your epigenetic program, you're not going to change as well. Absolutely. Easy answer. Just no. <laughs> um, so I, I like that explanation because, yeah, you know, philosophically, I think I had some some hope there. But again, the, the preventative medicine approach and focusing on on that. Um, now, I know we're getting short on time here. One thing I just I just have to ask you, you, you have this 
more recent twins study. Can you just give us the Cliff Notes version or a little, you know, kind of introduction into the twins study and what you found? Sure. Uh, so this one got boy a lot of interest, I must say, more than I thought it would. So I had a colleague at the university who um, we have a twin registry in the, in the state of Washington where basically all twins are sort of registered and then they can do studies on the twins and they like to do that because they, they contribute to the science. And so he's been, he was, he was oversaw the uh, Washington state twin registry for a long time. He's a director of it. So he came to me and said, we have these twins that essentially, um, have different exercise. They're discordant in their exercise. So one of the twins has really low sort of levels of exercise and the other ones have vigorous exercise. And when we see this, we also see these metabolic sort of obesity type type, type fetus, uh, uh, changes going on. And everybody knows if you exercise a lot, you're going to lose weight and actually be more physically fit and so forth. So, but we never really thought about it before. Well, what's going on? What's the molecular mechanism behind those changes that you're getting from the physical exercise? So we did the study and basically found that the epigenetics was very different between the low exercise and, and high exercise. And the phenotypes were also, in terms of obesity, so that, that associated very nicely. And so essentially, uh, we, we, so we put that together and published it. And... <laughs> Within two or three weeks, this paper had had, had something like 500 million reaches. So, oh, wow. And so, you know, step back. So we, we published the glyphosate paper on epigenetics, and that got, you know, two or three hundred, you know, uh, uh, a million. But uh, this one even did better. So I, I, and it turns out that a lot of these exercises or people in society and so forth have come to me and they said, we never had a molecular mechanism behind what the exercise did. And so the fact that we now have, have an understanding that if we do this exercise, we're changing our programming on the epigenetic level, and that will shift our, you know, susceptibility to get obesity and have all these obesity traits and metabolism and everything else. So, the, so really it was just another environmental sort of thing of exercise that was actually promoting this epigenetic shift, causing these phenotypes going forward. So that was our most recent one that I studied. Uh, basically, so now we have a new a new phenomenon of this, this. That's how exercise works. So now I think you could do things like take the, the ultra athletes that do the marathons and so forth and actually see the, how these degrees could change based on their epigenetics and things because now there's a molecular basis for that. Yeah, that's 500 million views. That's a lot. <laughs> uh, wow. I was thinking... Yeah, your other papers I know are just so popular, very, very famous. I'm like, there's, there's no way, but I, I, you know, have the Google alert set up and I just saw that study over and over again in all of these different articles, which really, again, prop prompted me to, to reach out to you and, and have you on here. So I wanted to give that twin study some, some love and there's not a lot of, yeah, I, I don't think there's really any of epigenetic studies looking at exercise, right? So now they have that, um, information and hopefully we can look at different types of athletes and, and the epigenetic mechanisms behind that. So what's next for you? Are you going more in the twins route? Yeah, I know you're looking at the rat models in different generations and that takes time, but you know, what's on your radar? So yeah, we, the, the generation study will probably get up to 20 within the year. And, and so that'll be interesting. And just from the phenotypes we're seeing, it's going to be a little scary. So in other words, I think if, if you, as you take this out, it's actually going to show that you end up getting more and more disease uh, as time goes on, probably because there's subtle sort of environmental things that actually promote it more and more. So that's something we're in the process of doing. We have several of these uh, disease states that we're actually going after in terms of biomarkers. Um, we have a, a preeclampsia co uh, a project going on with preterm birth sort of induced thing. Preterm birth, you have to understand, it's another environmental thing. If you're pre, if you're a preterm baby, that just the preterm condition will shift the epigenetics very dramatically and cause a significant amount of disease later in life just due to that. And then, unfortunately, you have children, and you pass some of those things on to your. And so, 
the pregnancy issue today, if we could reduce preterm births, would be a significant impact on health of our society. So preeclampsia is one of the main or a main driver for that sort of process. So we have a project going on. Yeah. There's another uh, one of the, we've studied male infertility quite a bit because it's easier to look at sperm than it is in eggs and females. But one of the chief causes for the reduction in female fertility right now is known as polycystic ovarian disease. It's a disease that we can't really detect really easily. If we knew it was susceptible for it, they do have a few things that you could do to actually prevent it. And so that one is another. So we have a couple of the diseases we're trying to get. To. But believe it or not, it's hard to get funding for these sort of things. And so that's the biggest uh, issue for us. Yeah. Our funding levels are just so low. It's it's getting harder and harder to do the research in general. Yeah, I just spoke to a, even a couple PhD students the other day and, and had them on, on the podcast, you know, about the, the struggles with funding. And that's something I don't think people really, the general public, I would say, understands, right? I remember um, being in college and like my professors putting up, you know, no office hours today working on a grant. And I would get so, I would become so frustrated. I'm like, what does a grant entail, right? Um, oh, and now I know what it entails because, you know, we're, we're doing a lot of those grants at True Diagnostics. So um, it's, it's definitely frustrating, especially for all of the, all of the great work you do. So, you know, I really appreciate your time, Dr. Skinner. I have one curveball question that I always ask everyone on my podcast. If you could be any animal in the world, what would you be and why? An animal in the world. <laughs> Anything. Uh, well, I'm a, quite a fisherman, so I wouldn't be a fish, that's for sure. Um, okay. Uh, I don't know. I, I spent a lot of time in Africa, and I really, and it's, the wildlife there is amazing. I don't know if I can pick a specific animal. I've always had an affinity for a hawk, I guess, or an eagle. So something like that. Okay. Yeah, there we go. No, process of elimination, working through through those thoughts. I, I like it. So thanks again, Dr. Skinner. I learned a lot. I know my audience is, is definitely going to be interested in your work. I'll make sure I link out, you know, all of your papers and, and put links, uh, of course, giving extra attention to that twin study. So, um, you know, thank you everyone for joining us at Everything Epigenetics Podcast. And remember, you have control over your epigenetics. So tune in next time to learn a little bit more. Thanks, Dr. Skinner. Thank you.